All right. We are back uh, with another installment of Accepting the Challenges. Accepting the Challenges, if those of you, uh, if this is your first um, listen or watch, uh, what we want to do is we want to create a platform that gives educators some spotlight, some love, some shine, and, and really kind of peel the curtain back and allow educators to to showcase who they are, share their journey, share some insight and tips for other educators, and really give that appreciation that um, I feel like, and that we feel like here at Accepting the Challenges, that educators just kind of get slighted a little bit. And, and they truly do exactly what we talk about here at Accepting the Challenges. And they wake up every single day and they accept those challenges that those young people bring into them. Uh, some of them you could you, you could you could show up for work and hear your student's best day of his life or or you could, you know, bump into a kid and a kid tell you the most horrendous, horrific thing that you could ever imagine happening to a child. So um, today um, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to address him first uh, by doctor because he has earned that title um, and then throughout it uh, to be a little bit more casual. Uh, we'll we'll roll with Doug. But. Uh, Dr. Doug, and I did not ask about your last name, so I'm going to give this a go. Uh, Elmendorf. Perfect. Dr. Doug Elmendorf. Uh, Doug, if you will, share us a, a little bit about what your current position right now is and what you do. Uh, currently, I am a middle school principal in Baltimore County Public Schools. I uh, work in an area of the county uh, called Catonsville. It's the southwestern part of Baltimore County. So not Baltimore City, just right outside of Baltimore City. So awesome. enjoy uh, 875 middle schoolers. 875 middle schoolers. That was about yeah. the size of my uh, uh, of my high school um, when I was there. So and middle school there for you is that seventh and eighth or six, seventh and eighth? Six, seven and eight. Six, seven and eight. Okay, yeah. fantastic. So now now let's get into the good stuff. Let's go all the way back uh, back to the young the young Doug. Oh, tell, tell us a little bit about your journey through life and and how kind of you got to this this education. Sure. So grew up in uh, northeast Philadelphia in a, a place called Ben Salem and knew uh, maybe a sophomore year of high school that I wanted to do something at the time with music. So went to um, Ithaca College in central New York and got my a bachelor's degree in um, music education and saxophone performance. Uh, from there, I actually thought that I wanted to teach in Hawaii. I had visited Hawaii a couple times when I was younger okay. and uh, with my family. And so I was like, you know, this is the perfect time to do it. It's expensive to live there, but I'm by myself. I don't have any expenses. So um, while I was uh, raising some money to go over there to teach and actually got a teaching position, um, I had an offer from a, a grad school, University of Massachusetts, to come and do an assistantship. And I felt like that was something I couldn't pass up. So I ended up passing up instead the teaching uh, position in Hawaii. But I had already bought the plane ticket, had already saved the money. So I went and lived in Hawaii for a summer. So that was pretty cool. Did a lot of nice. scuba diving and stayed at a youth hostel. So uh, got bed bugs from the youth hostel. That wasn't great. But besides <laughs> that, it was a good experience. Uh, yes, so, I've, I've heard stories. <laughs> so came back from Hawaii. Uh, did two years in grad school um, music performance in, at the University of Massachusetts. But uh, while I was there, I had an opportunity to actually go to Senegal, West Africa, and teach kindergarten for a little while. Um, I actually went there to help with um, some self-help help, help efforts that were being done there with an organization called Oxfam America. But because I had some teaching experience and a degree, they asked if I could do some um, teaching in the kindergarten class. And it was then that I realized that my plan to go and be a performer, a music performer, if you will, um, what needed to change. I needed to do something with kids instead. And so it was in it, within just a few minutes being in front of those five-year-olds um, that I realized that teaching is, and, and being in education is something that I needed to do, that I was being called to do. So I came home from Senegal, let my saxophone professor know that I was not going to be um, you know, auditioning for the army band or whatever the case might be. I was planning on looking for a teaching job. He wasn't happy about it, but he supported me. And um, so I started looking for a teaching position and ended up in Baltimore County. Baltimore County was attractive to me because it's a large school district. Uh, so it had a lot of opportunities as it relates to music. And this is back in 1998 that I moved to Baltimore County. 
Um, so I taught elementary school music for a little while. And while I was teaching, I was uh, taking one class a semester in um, educational leadership because I really felt like uh, that was a direction I wanted to go. I know a lot mm -hmm. of people say when they're teachers, oh, I, I never thought I'd be a, an administrator, um, but somebody really pushed me along the way. That's not really my story. My story is more along the lines of I really thought it would be kind of cool to be an administrator and have uh, some deeper influence on what goes on in our country as it relates to teaching kids. Um, so eventually um, became an assistant principal in an elementary school, went to another elementary school, um, fast forwarding to becoming a principal. Uh, while I was doing that, I decided, uh, I guess I like going to school because I wanted to pursue a doctorate. And in this area at the time, uh, online learning wasn't really too much of a thing. There were some mm -hmm. hybrid courses, but in order for me to get to a class on time as part of a doctoral program, I would have had to leave school early and that just wasn't really an option. Um, except for the one university that was near my house, uh, Towson University, mm -hmm. but their doctorate was in instructional technology. And back when I was considering a doctorate, um, I was borrowing my roommate's computer and didn't really know how to use it that well. So, um, you know, with some encouragement from some, some professors and some friends, they said, you know, just apply and see what happens. And I did. I had a, uh, a portfolio that I had to submit that if I look back on it now, it would be pretty embarrassing, I think, just because of where <laughs> my skill level was, but also where technology was at the sure. time. Um, so pr pursued the doctorate um, while I was also uh, moving up, I guess, in the education world. Um, the, the next big change, I guess, in my life after being an elementary school principal for a little while, um, I realized having four kids and um, three of the four had, were, had gone through middle school, that middle school was this place where there wasn't enough attention given to what was going on there, including the students. So we have elementary school where uh, it's just, it's so cool. I'm in my kindergarten, it's just, it's great. They're so cute. Then you have high school where planning, you're playing sports, you're planning on college and it's a really exciting time. But then there's this messy middle where you yes. have these, yes. these students who are going through a crazy hormonal changes and they're trying to find their identity and they get, get kind of lost in the sauce, the messy middle, I like to call it. Absolutely. And I wanted to be able to have some influence on that. I have twins who are now in 11th grade, and boy and girl twins. And when they went through middle school, they both had great experiences, but they both had great experiences for different reasons. So I, I realized that we could probably customize and personalize some middle school experiences to really help every student feel connected and feel um, like they're getting plugged in so that when they eventually get to high school, they really are set up for su success. So that's how I get to become eventually a middle school principal. The only other thing I'll say is that uh, something I'm pretty passionate about is the use of instructional technology, which is what my doctorate is in, especially in this world where we're using technology so much. But as a result, I do um, an adjunct at uh, Johns Hopkins University. I teach a, a course once a year called Emerging Issues in Digital Age Learning, which is a master's level course in which we explore all of the uh, concepts and, and issues, I guess, that are related to the use of technology in our world. Um, just revise the course actually to talk about how does COVID affect sure. all these things that are happening, you know, different digital divide and uh, the pervasive use of the technology in people who aren't even using technology before and those kinds of things. So that's yeah. kind of my, my story and my journey. Awesome. Awesome. It's that, yeah, me messy middle is, uh, <laughs> is uh is a proper term so so for those of you that that haven't really caught another episode so my wife is a is a middle school special ed teacher and um yeah i can tell you it is 100 uh uh the messy middle and you know you're you, you know at 12 13 14 you're kind of at this awkward age like oh, you yeah. said like like ev everything's awkward right like yeah every um, middle school should have the term the word awkward in its title <laughs> it's yes just, yes it's, it's just, like it's like um, all of a sudden, you know, maybe I want a boyfriend or girlfriend. Uh, well, wait a second. All of a sudden I have my own opinions on things and should I, you know, I'm just going to force them on you and tell you what I, you know, what I think. Like there, there's all these things that are happening and, uh, it, it's a transition into life. Um, so, and so I tell people, um, and and I've, i my wife being an educator i'm around other educators so um a lot of people in my family my dad my stepmom my stepsister my wife my wife has family members who have been educators you know you you don't really know what a bad day is unless you're <laughs> unless you're a middle school teacher 
um, right. and had a bad day, right? Like yeah. you, yeah. high school, it's kind of like, you know what? You're either going to listen to me or not. If you're not, then I'm going to kick you out of class and we're going to move on. Like, like life, life starts to become yeah. more real. And, you know, if you, if you don't want to do it, that's fine. Then we're going to pass you by, right? right? Elementary school, it's, it's in all of these are hard. I'm not devaluing sure. any, any level of teaching, uh, but middle schoolers, there's just a different kind of grace, almost, if you will, that you have to develop um, and, a, and a, just a different level of empathy that comes along uh, with that. Yeah, it, it is a transition. It's it's only three years compared to five, six, seven years in elementary school and another four in high school. Um, but we need to find good people, in my opinion, to nav help students navigate that transition because it is a really difficult time for kids and for parents. Parents aren't sure. that like, Are they independent now or should I still be kind of nurturing them? Or like, where are we with this whole transition sure. thing? And when they get to high school, it's like, okay, they're going to kind of do their own thing maybe. But um, middle school is... Uh, and in, even in our education system, we don't say elementary, middle, and high. We say elementary and secondary. You yeah. know, when, when students go through colleges to become teachers, what kind of teacher do you want to be? I want to be an elementary teacher or I want to be a secondary. Um, I actually, when I'm uh, interviewing teachers, why do you want middle school? And if I get an answer that's something like, well, I want secondary because I'll ask it again. Why do you want middle school? Because middle school and high school are completely different. Oh. From one completely another. different animals yeah. so so i went to i went to a junior high mm. uh so so ours was only seventh and eighth grade so you, okay. in where, where where i went to school um here in kentucky you go through k through six um okay. is your is your elementary and then you went to junior high which is seventh and eighth and then you went to high school and went on um so so you mentioned so so actually let's dive into that a little bit you mentioned when you hire what what do you look for when when you're hiring someone for middle school because you've you've had some time at both an elementary and right. a middle school now um what 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 are some of those things you do look for at a middle school i think most importantly and it's usually the first question we ask in some way shape or form is why specifically middle school? And I don't know that if I was a high school principal and when I was in elementary school, I, I don't know if I asked that specifically, why an elementary teacher? Um, but in middle school, I think that is important because um, the kids are going through so much. And I want to hear an answer that's along the lines of giving me an idea that this candidate knows what middle schoolers are like, whether they have their own middle schooler at home or they've had an internship experience or they've done research or whatever the case might be. Um, that they're ready to be there, especially in this environment, in a social emotional way and not just looking to um, teach content. The, when I was in elementary school, of course, we have different perceptions of different levels, uh, which is kind of neat to be in, quote, secondary now that I was in elementary for such a long time. But as you know, you talk to elementary folks, they're like, oh, yeah, those secondary people, all they care about is content. And of course, the secondary folks are all oh, those elementary kid people care about is, you know, relationships and all that uh, fun stuff. Um, I don't think either one of those things is necessarily true, um, but if the if the candidate's really focusing just on content, it gives me some pause and makes me ask some additional questions to see what what are you going to do to develop the relationships uh, with your students. I know it's a, it's an, uh, a saying that's used quite a bit, but the kids don't care how much you know, especially middle schoolers, oh. until they know how much you care about them. A absolutely. Um, it's funny you say that. So I was uh, in in middle school is one of those ones that it's kind of like the forgotten child it's like the middle child right? right like you know when, when, we, when we talk about having you know yeah. three kids right so um i was talking to a superintendent and and we we did an interview and then off air he was like man he's like you know can i can i get you booked in to come and talk when we're able to um you know back at some of our high schools and i said well i actually i'm, I'm happy to do that but i actually think that that my story and my journey can help a lot more middle schoolers but mm. and right. he's like he, he's like man He's like, I just say high school because I think most most people just would rather go. He said, but our, he's like, I get one call to every 10 of people who want to speak at a middle school in the high school because they think that. But our middle school kids need that, um, you know, yeah. a lot more. They need more exposure to those things. And, and that's what I was going to ask you. Do you think that you have to have a higher emotional intelligence um, or a higher level of emotional intelligence to be a middle school teacher than maybe in some of the other ones? I do, I, because one of the components that I, I mentioned this briefly 
uh, of middle school is the parent component, especially now in a virtual environment. But even before that and after that, hopefully soon, um, the, the, the parents aren't sure how to handle the messy middle either necessarily, either at home as a parent or, or more um, indicative to us, this whole idea of what middle school should even look like. So it's important not only I can't be the only one who's communicating with the parents, right, as the administrator. So the teacher really has to be um, in partnership with the parents. So if I get a sense from the interview, too, if that, this, that the teacher's going to really have kind of some difficulties um, navigating the, the relationships with parents, then that gives me some pause as well. And, you know, conversely, if they seem like they would just, you know, knock the ball out of the park as it relates to um, having those partnerships with parents, that's really somebody I keep um, an interest in. For sure. Yeah, I, 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 absolutely, and I can I can see where I can see where that um, that those communication skills are, yeah. are 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 massively vital. And and I get it. I remember when my oldest became a teenager and was and it was like, who created this monster? Right? Like it was like, yeah. where, where, wait a second. Yesterday, in my my oldest is a daughter, um, and and you know they 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 go through those transitioned a year or two earlier than, than boys do. And, um, I remember I was like, literally we were just hanging out, snuggled up on the couch, watching a movie literally yesterday. Why, where, where is all this coming from? You know, where is, and, and it's just a, it is a, it's a journey. It's a journey, right? Um, what do you in, in, I, I, I get, cause relationships obviously, uh, matter and you talked about not as much about content as it is you know those things I, I, how do you feel about because I, I i believe this i'm i'm, mm -hmm. I'm an ad, i'm a big advocate for mental health right. um I, I i have a therapist that i go to um but it, it do you think we're eventually going to and i guess do you think we're eventually going to from a national level start implementing some of these things but but is are there things that you kind of implement within your uh, realm to where middle school is where we really start developing our emotional intelligence. We, we start developing our, um, you know, self-awareness. Do you think we'll eventually get to a more intentional way of teaching kids how to deal with anxiety, how to deal with some of these things that are naturally going to occur anyway in life, but in a way to kind of arm them to be a little bit more prepared, I guess. I do. I think we need to, and that's, that is something we're trying to do at our school. Um, you know, there are some bad things that are uh, happening as a result of us, you know, the pandemic, obviously. Sure. It's not ideal that we're online, but it's incumbent upon us to leverage some of these situations that we're in to uh, make, make some changes that we might not have made um, if this pandemic didn't happen to us. So one of the things we're um, doing is, and I know this isn't new at all, Ron Clark Academy, I know does it, but this whole idea of a virtual um, house group kind of situation. Um, we did some student focus groups last year. And one of the things that the students said, and we didn't really realize they were gonna say that you can kind of anticipate sometimes, but didn't anticipate, they really want to know their teachers better, the students. And when we dug a little deeper, the students wanted to know their teachers better because they really felt like they needed a person uh, to talk to that was you know, especially in middle school, you need to navigate some of that stuff with an adult as opposed to another student. But they wanted to get to know each other better as well. And so we're, we've tried to create this virtual environment um, where the students can not only connect with uh, their teacher and one another in the grade level, but the houses are multi-grade level. So they're actually connecting with some mentor type students um, that might be older than them. And then it's also given our eighth graders a chance to um, build some of those uh, skills that we could, they can, you know, mentor some of the younger kids. Um, and so part of that integrated in all of that ideally is, are these mini lessons and these conversations that really help to get at how do we uh, navigate this new normal that we're experiencing or this transition that we're experiencing as middle yeah. schoolers, but also going through this pandemic and how do we uh, navigate it next time it happens or something else crisis related happens? How do we navigate that together? How do we lean on each other? Um, what are things that we can do social emotionally to um, help ourselves to be more successful when we actually are trying to get our homework done and we're actually trying to learn the math content or or read the novel and understand it? Yeah, some some time back. So I'm gonna I'm gonna share a story and ask um, ask a question at the end of it. So some time back, I remember my wife coming to me and she said, "Hey, I've got this student in class. Um, he's he's Shane. He's smart. Like he he is a smart kid, but." 
I cannot get him to just engage. Like he will not. Yeah. He, he yeah. loves me. He comes in, says hi to me, talks to me, shares with me his personal life. Those things. He just will not do the work. Like I can't. She said, mm. "Will you come in and you know bring lunch in one day? I'll have him come eat lunch in my room. Will you bring lunch?" And of course, I've, I'm on the list to kind of talk and come in yeah. and that kind of thing. So I said, "Okay." I said, I'll, I'll, "I'll come in." So we came in and we sat down and the conversation, of course, for him did not go exactly how he he typically. Because I'm not I'm not a teacher. I'm not bound by the same. Um, you know, I definitely kept it PG 13, uh, with him, but it was like, look, man, don't like, I, I come from where you come from. You know, I know this is what you, I, I eliminated all the barriers he thought existed because, because okay. he knew who I was, right. My wife had obviously told him my husband travels around and, you know, he, these different things. So like, he's looking at me, like, I want to be that guy. Right. So, um, but he didn't know my past. So I eliminated all of those barriers really, really quick with him. And like, look, I know this is what you're doing. This is what you're saying in class. And this is why I know every time you get up and go to the bathroom, I know you take the long way. I know mm -hmm. you're doing this, you know, all these things. And he's looking at me like, how do you know all this? And yeah. he asked me that. He's like, how did you like, how do you? I was like, because I was you. So right. now let's figure out how to help you get to where you want to be without having to deal with what I had to deal with. Right. And and I eventually would come in. Um, I said, look, we're going to make an agreement that if I find out that these grades drop, that I'm going to come in. And his and his family was totally on board with it. Right. I was like, I I'm going to come in and I'm going to sit with you. And I said, look, I barely graduated high school. So, you know, more of this stuff than I do. So I'm not here to do it for you because I have no idea the work you're doing. Right. I'm going to sit here and we're going to keep you on task. And I would come in and we'd sit and we'd sit in the conference room every now and then and we'd sit there and i'm like look nope like we're going to get it done like you're not going to tell me you can't do it i know better and we went through that so my question is do you think or how important is it for people from a mentor standpoint and community involvement how important are those things for those kids that are that maybe need a little bit more attention because as educators you know you have to, like school has to go on class has to go on you you've got right. As a teacher, you've got 27 other students in class that you've got to you've got to keep sure. up with. How important is that? It's super important. And in the middle school, it's uh, it's trickier. I think um, we're talking about students transitioning. And you mentioned how girls kind of make that transition a little bit uh, quicker, perhaps, um, which is, is definitely sometimes the case. So we. We differentiate instruction, we talk about that all the time, but we really need to almost differentiate the way we relate to kids because we might have a fifth grader coming in the sixth grader who's just ready to hit the ground running and they don't really want to mess with you as the teacher too much because they got their own yeah. thing going. Yeah. Um, and so you don't necessarily treat that, that student the same way you would who the student like you're talking about, that student that you're talking about obviously needed a little extra attention for sure. Um, but one thing that we're, we're dealing with now in our schools is just this, the, the historically most teachers statistically are white women yes and so yes. Uh, what if you have white males and black males and black females in your school and we all do or most of us do um, they don't necessarily uh, have a person that looks like them to relate Absolutely. to them um, we just did some um, professional development with our staff and one of the questions we said to them was when do you remember what who was your first teacher that was a minority Yep. teacher or who, who was your first teacher that was black or what, what you can change the question however you sure, fit, sure. but um and some people it's like college was the first time yep. i had a teacher that yep. was didn't look like me yep. yep so flip that on its end there are some students who never have a teacher that looks like them or the, it's a long time before they have a teacher that looks like them and that makes it a little bit harder i think for those for those students to navigate um things in a social emotional way especially Absolutely. Absolutely. Someone that can speak my language. It's kind of like, um, so I have another podcast that I do with a friend of mine and, and that's what we talk about. We talk about race and, and, and we talk about these things. Um, and what I find interesting is, um, it is, is teaching is very similar to what has happened. And I'd realize this may be, um, a bit, um, I don't know, a hot topic, but teaching has historically been very similar to how we staff police force, right? You, they're hiring someone from outside of the community to come in 
and that comes in who doesn't live there, who doesn't know those families, who doesn't know those people, who doesn't even know the culture, maybe coming from another state or and I'm here in Kentucky, right? So a majority of your, you know, the largest population of schools are in your cities, right? But a majority of your teachers are coming from these rural towns of a thousand right. people, 500 people, like they're coming in because they, they come to the university, get a degree and then get a job, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so what happens in the police force, for example, um, is like Detroit. If you are it, it, for years, because they had such a, um, a housing crisis happen there, the city went and purchased a massive amount of homes. So if you were a police officer, you would get a, you'd get a, you would get a home there. Well, the problem okay. is, is there's so many people that are like, Oh, I can get a free house. Like I can start right. my career. I can go do that. And they go there, but they don't know those communities. They, they don't understand them. And I, so I think it's a huge thing of, of, of that approach and how you're bringing attention to those things, uh, because they matter. They, they absolutely matter for, um, even when you go down and you talk about a young man who uh, or a young woman who's grown up in a home without a dad or out of, without a male figure at all, mm -hmm. you know, when they hit that puberty, I'm becoming an adult and all of a sudden a male figure is telling them what to do. It's hard emotionally to sometimes process that and understand like, huh, what? Like, I don't like I'm 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 missing it. And, I, and I've seen I've seen the flip side of it, even to where you have kids who are at home and there's a lot of domestic violence, right? So then their respect for females and female um, authority figures isn't there. So there's this constant disrespect. They're almost imitating what they see sometimes at home. And, um, you know, I, 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 I often wonder what more can we do to help educators understand that? Um, you sound like you obviously get it. Um, and that's, I think that's an awesome thing. Well, one of the things that really complicates uh, some of this now is that the use of social media, uh, just, you know, with kids back and forth on social media, but also just what kids are seeing in social media and just media in general. Sure. Um, trying to, and I think that's one thing we can do to help kind of some of these situations is to uh, help the students learn how to navigate their technology safely. As much as I'm a huge advocate of uh, leveraging technology, obviously, um, social media has created a problem that is hard for us as administrators and school-based staff to um, help with um, effectively because it's, you know, you know how it is. It's, it's away. It's gone. I, you can't prove who wrote it and all those kinds of things. Sure. But those things matter because it almost always affects our students and how they feel about themselves. Again, in middle school, it's all about how you feel about yourself. Um, so, if they don't feel good about themselves and then they come in and they're trying to learn algebra, it, it just doesn't work as well. So um, one thing that we're trying to do and it's tough is to help students understand what it means to have a healthy uh, online life. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and, and it's funny you bring that up. So when I, when I travel around and I talk and I have a group of parents, um, I actually pull my phone out and I ask, I say, how many of you in the room allow your child to have a smartphone? And of course they all raise their hand. You know, mm -hmm. they go and I said, OK, put your hands down and I'll even be I'll even do this in a foreign country where um, these things are outlawed. And I'll say, OK, how many of you, by show of hands, allow your child to walk around with a gun every day? And of course, nobody raises their hand. And I said, OK, well, this that you're allowing your child to carry around is probably more dangerous and has taken more lives around the world than a gun in a mm. child's hand. And they look at me and they're like, what? And I said, so if I said, let's let's say you did give your child a gun every day. At the very least, you would train them on how to keep themselves and keep others safe. You have to do the same thing with this and you have to understand the technology. And I'll say and the kids will be sitting there and I'll say, I challenge you tonight, not because of an invasion of privacy. I challenge you tonight to sit down and go through your child's phone and understand what they're using, how they're using it. And you, you should see the kid's face when <laughs> this happens. It's delete, like, delete, delete, delete. <laughs> it's like, no, no, the parents will reach and they'll grab it. Like, they'll, like yeah. they'll reach in the, and the kids are looking like, what did you just do? Right. So, and I tell them, I say, you know, there's, there's apps like that look like a calendar or calculator and they're sure. not a calculator. Right. Like the, like these things you have to understand, because if we're going like 
I'm with you. I, I think I think the technology is fortunately, unfortunately, agree or disagree. Technology will forever be a part of our society as we know it. Right. And it's going to continue to be a part of it. But we have to teach people. And it's in that shouldn't is is that going to evolve and be part of an ongoing education that happens from an educator standpoint? Yes, it is. But that has to be taught at home. It has to be taught in society. It has to be taught. It's almost like, you know, I joke like you have to go through a concealed carry, you know, uh, uh, class to carry to carry a gun. I think there should be unless under a certain age, under a certain under a certain age. Like if, if, you, if I have to go take a test, I have to take two tests to drive a car so that I don't drive around this moving missile and, and hurt someone, right. then, then you should have to do that under a certain age. If you, if you want to carry around a smartphone. Um, and I think it would eliminate a lot of those things, I think. So, um, so let me ask you this, uh, Doug, why do you do what you do? Well, I think I can answer that question by saying what I like most about what I do, perhaps. And that is, um, and we're talking about this a little bit already, but I really enjoy being in situations where I can see people's reactions to doing things that they never thought they could do. That they, prior to the experience that they might have had, they thought they would never be able to do that. That could be my assistant principals, it could be teachers, it could be students. Um, just watching someone grow personally or professionally to the point where they um, achieved something that they never thought they had the, uh, the capability of doing. And so what I try to, to really do and I enjoy doing is try to create environments in which I'm looking for people where I can find the potential in them that they might not see in themselves and then do a couple of things to, you know, push them a little bit beyond their, their comfort zone and then, uh, you know, set up an environment in which they can, um, grow and be successful despite the fact that they thought they might not be able to do that man i think that's a phenomenal answer um oh, because it <laughs> well no it is it is because and, th and this is why i love this is why i love educators right because a majority of you do it for the right reasons and what you're explaining is not is there is there a piece of self-gratification that comes out of that yes we all want uh -huh. to be we all i think most educators at the at the at their core have an altruistic drive of wanting to help others but what i don't think a lot of people see and understand is the ripple effect out of that because essentially what you're explaining that you enjoy doing is giving people confidence to be happy in what they do right, right? And right. so when you do that, when you give an educator confidence, when you give someone, when you give one of your teachers confidence and they, and that light clicks, it's no different when the light clicks for a 13 year old than trying to solve that algebra problem. Right. It's no different when that light clicks for the eighth grader that you sat and had a conversation because you noticed that when they went and dumped their tray at lunch, they stopped and picked up a couple of other classmates trays and just out of a nice gesture, they were going anyway. And then you you point that out to them and you let them know, you know, and you share with them how that's going to help them in life. That is a ripple effect because that carries on. And, and I can remember. And so my dad ran a, a local um, baseball park, um, hmm. baseball league community for a couple of years. And I, re I remember my dad and I did, did, did and still do not have the greatest of relationships. Um, hmm. But I can remember one of the very few times my dad pointing something out to me that I did something good. And that was a friend of mine who I ended up going and playing four years of high school basketball with and, and this, but his dad, um, I, 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 I greeted him. I, he stopped and said something to me. Yes, sir. No, sir. You know, it, very simple. I didn't think anything of it. Literally it was Mr. Lawrence. I, I come in contact with you all the time. We're, we're just around each other. And I remember on the ride home, I guess he had ran into my dad and he mentioned that to my dad. Hey, you know, your son, very respectful. One of the very few times I remember my dad saying, hey, you know, uh, you know, I, I don't know even know if he said I'm proud of you. I just think I remember him acknowledging like, hey, you know, you did that. That's how you're supposed to go about it. Those things like it, it's those little things that matter even as an adult. Right. E even sure. I mean, e e if you I, I would assume the 
if one of your teachers won an award for the Maryland middle school teacher of the year, you would be over the moon. You absolutely, th- yeah. that, that, yeah. it, and it, you'd probably be more excited for them than you would be if you got it because <laughs> right, exactly. it, it, it's that yeah. affirmation. I think it was, uh, I think it was John Maxwell and I could be wrong who said that leadership is influence. And so I'm either going to, I'm I'm the leader, whether I should be or not, I've been appointed as the principal of the school. So I'm going to influence people in some way, shape or form. And I'd rather it be a positive influence. So, but I think we need to create an environment in which we're doing that intentionally, as opposed to just knowing that we're going to influence people and just hoping it happens the right way. Yeah. T- telling people what to do is not being a leader. That, that, uh, that, that's actually, if that is a majority <laughs> of what you're doing, you have done a bad job as a leader in hiring people and putting people around you to do their job. And right. That 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 is that is definitely true. Is, I tell you what, Doug, you're you're. Uh, I, I never know getting on these interviews who I'm going to talk to and <laughs> where their mindset are. I'm I'm really thrilled to to, to get to know you here. Oh, how, you. How, how 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 diverse is your school there? What, what how, uh, it's not tremendously diverse actually. Um, we have it's about twenty five percent African American and the rest is white, with you know a real small percentage of. Um, some Middle Eastern families that have uh, come yep. in this area in the, recently. But yeah, we're pretty much a 75, 25 kind of school. And so we do struggle with most of our teachers are white, as you can imagine. And um, so some of our black students struggle with uh, navigating what's already going to be a tough situation in middle school um, in a successful way when they don't see people that look like them. So so let me ask you this, because you brought it up uh, and I hope I don't you don't mind me asking. So um, how, how have you guys navigated the waters with the current racial tension and, and different things? Because they're seeing this in the news. They're you know, sure. they're being exposed to it. It is um, for those of us that are are aware of how these conversations. So, so these racial conversations are happening every day in um, a family of colors household, whereas right. in the white family, it may not get discussed ever. Uh, it may not get discussed, get d- discussed at all. Yeah. So, so how, how are you helping your staff? What are maybe some of the things, if you have some of the things that you've done to try and, Hey, look, these are, this is what's going on. Let's, you know, let, let's, let's address this. Let's, let's handle this this way and that. Yeah. So, so it's been a little bit difficult to, um, navigate just because we're not seeing students in person. So yeah. ideally we would be, you know, sitting down with them and giving them opportunities to express themselves and ask questions and those kinds of things. And we've done that. We've just had to do it virtually. So this sure. is, you know, we're talking, I guess, what like April, May, yep. school's ending. We're trying to figure out how we're going to get the, the kids stuff back to them and those kinds of things. But what, basically we leveraged, um, we use Google meet in Baltimore County. Yep. Yep. We leveraged Google meet to um, get together with teachers first and listen to their stories and listen to their truths and, and move forward from there to then um, try as best as we can to meet with students. Uh, we have some, some clubs, which I think are super important by the way, in middle school okay. um, to get s- students connected. And some of those clubs, they met virtually cause they already knew each other pretty well and their advisor knew the students well. And so we navigated some conversations with that. One thing that we were really trying to avoid doing is not, is ha- um, not requiring teachers to navigate that conversation if they're not comfortable doing so. Cause that could make the situation sure. worse rather than yeah, better. Yeah. 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 I've also Go ahead. You have, to have, you have to have that sensitivity to uh, actually understand. Y- y- right. Yeah. Yeah. You can I think, you know, we, well, you all need to know our own um, inherent biases and those kinds of things before we can ever really do a good job of helping other people understand what, what's going on. So um, I actually had some students reach out to me because um, again, they're able to message me through the, the, the platform that we use, which is Schoology. And what, you know, what can we do Dr. Almendorf to um, show support for what we, believe to be um, important to show support for. And so we kind of, um, with COVID, it's hard again to like, normally we would have kids do certain things together, but we couldn't. So uh, one thing that we did is we had students came to the school. They socially distanced. This is a uh, beginning of June, I want to say. Okay. Um, and they created artwork to, um, to support like, you know, Black Lives Matter, yeah. um, peace and those kinds of, and they, we posted all over the, the outside of the school. Awesome. Actually, in, inside the school, so it wouldn't get wet, but, you know, on the windows all around yeah, the school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's awesome. So that, and so it was a way for them to express themselves and one that they really appreciated. Um, and then now that we're actually back into school, uh, virtual for all of us right now so far, uh, is we're trying to make that um, 
discussion more of an integrated part of what we do, especially in social studies, uh, where we're, we're seeking some guidance from our equity office and our social studies office to make sure that we're um, creating spaces where students can um, express themselves and talk about it in ways that are constructive and maybe even academic to help them really um, push, put these two things together, uh, look at history and how history has, yeah. you know, kind of dictated what is now happening to us and what can we do um, now as people who are living now so that the future is better for everybody, us and our, you know, our kids. And, that and, it, and it feels like for the first time now I'm 40, so I'm not, I wouldn't, th my kids probably think I'm old, but I'm, I, don't, <laughs> I, don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think I'm old. Um, it, for the first time, it feels like we might be kind of going over that tipping point to where we finally can get our history lessons corrected um, and mm -hmm. a little mm -hmm. bit more um, factual, I guess maybe you would, maybe you would say, I guess, um, because you know, it's, it's, it's been, I don't know, for lack of a better term, whitewashed in some, in some sure. ways of, yeah. of, of, and I think that is a big part of it, of, you know, and, and you talked about, um, teachers who may not be well-versed or they're, they're actually understanding that goes back to that, right? Like, you know, we, we have sure. people, um, I would say, 40 years old or younger, I would say 90% of white people don't really know what Jim Crow is. Um, you know, these different, these different things. So it's hard to, it's hard to really empathize and understand with something if you don't really know, um, what it is. So I think it's awesome yeah. that you guys, that you guys did that. Um, let me ask you this. So you've been in education for how long, how many years? Uh, 20, 22, okay. 22 years. Yeah. You've been in education for 22 years. If you could pick the phone up right now and, uh, call, call yeah. young Doug, 22, okay. yeah. 22 years ago, um, getting started on this education journey. What, what would you share with yourself? I, well, one thing I would, um, say that I should do that I did do was to, get out of my comfort zone. Um, and I'm talking about the African experience I had that that was probably the most, um, influential experience I had to the point where I've really encouraged my own kids to, uh, travel. My, my daughter did a missions trip in Haiti. My oldest son spent a year in England. Um, it really gives you a different perspective on life. So I would say good job for doing that. Uh, but the thing I would say, um, to myself, you know, and we're still, still talking about race kind of, is to try to enjoy or appreciate and understand other people's um, life story um, more often. Because I think for a really long time when I was a young educator, I felt like I, everybody's life was probably pretty similar to mine. Um, yeah. Just didn't really look outside of what and, and, you know, I grew up upper middle class white boy from the, the suburbs of Philly. That's just my story. And sure. I guess I thought everybody kind of had a similar story, sure. except the exception of the, the homeless person on the way to the Phillies game. I thought that everybody kind of had a life like mine. Sure. And so it was not true, obviously. And I wish I would have known more about that than I think I would have taught differently um, than, I, than, I, than I did. If awesome. I knew that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, and I think, I think world, world travel is something... Um, although we can't go right now, but it is becoming way more cost efficient to go. Um, it, it's not nearly as expensive. Um, you know, I, I, we, I took my, so I took my wife, um, my youngest daughter and my wife's aunt. So I took them last fall break. We went to, uh, London and Paris mm -hmm. and I mean, you, you just can't like what, how it gets you to think about like my, my daughter came back. She is, um, uh, she was eight at the time. So she's nine now mm -hmm. she came back and now she's taken online French lessons just because <laughs> she just, you know, she did, she just yeah. wants to understand and, it's you know, inspiring, every, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's seeing and realizing, Oh, well, you mean they don't have the same menu at McDonald's or, you know, they, you know, they do this or they do that. And, and we went and ate at some different, you know, ethnicity restaurants mm -hmm. and stuff because it's, it, it America is Americanized and it sure. is, it is what it is. But when you go and you, you know, you see these different things or you try these different things or you go to the market and, you know, you're eating, um, you know, uh, Somalian food or Ethiopian mm -hmm. food or, you know, you're tasting these things. It's it, it 
Uh, and food is one of the easiest ways I think to do that mm, is yeah. to open up your experience and your eyes and conversation yeah. happens and those things. So mm -hmm. yeah, it, wor world travel is something that, uh, and I think we, I think our tickets round trip from, we, we flew into, we flew into Paris and then took the train over into London and, um, and we flew home from London. I think it was like $340 round trip. Like it, it, it it's not expensive at all. It's not, right. you can actually get to, you can actually get to England here on the East coast cheaper than you can get to the West coast in the United States. So yeah. let me, um, did you, did you have a, did you have a teacher that, um, in your, kind of in your journey that really kind of stuck out and you were like, man, this is, I, I just, maybe they motivated you. Cause I know you, it sounds like you said you've kind of been on this intentional journey into what you're doing. Um, obviously there has to be a level of confidence. Was it a parent where, you know, where, where, where did that level of confidence from you come from? I don't know if there's any one person specifically. My parents were, were really supportive of anything that I wanted to do and they were really helpful. And, um, for example, in helping me find the right college, uh, I was a classical saxophone player, which most people don't even know exists, right? So you have to find the right college that's that's going to work yeah, for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were a huge help in in doing that. Um, my band director in in high school was was certainly influential. He was actually a classical saxophone player, so that was a uh, um, okay. He he kind of uh, helped me see what some possibilities are. You know, I followed a path that was similar to his for a while. Um, I had some a, a pastor when I was in high school too that was really influential to me as, as far as helping me get through some of those social emotional um, things that you have to go through as a high school student and, and draw some confidence from that. Um, but yes, yeah, so, I mean, like almost like a, the, the village rages the child kind of idea, sure. I guess, for me. There wasn't any one specific person necessarily that um, I would think of per se. Good. So do you still play the sax? Yeah, not not that much. Um, my you, daughter actually plays saxophone. She's sixteen. Do you ever pull it out <laughs> and, and play, play play for the students together? And I play for the students sometimes. Uh, they really like that, <laughs> <laughs> especially when I was in elementary school. They're like, I didn't even know you played. What a, yeah. You know. So <clears throat> yeah, so I, uh, not not too often anymore. I actually, during COVID, get, I played a little bit because there was nothing else to do. But. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So do you have um, do you have do you guys have a band there at the middle school? Do you have a band? We do. We have a band and an orchestra and a chorus. Oh yep. wow! So you probably hop in every now and then, yep. and uh, oh man, that's awesome. Teach that, a little that, bit here and there. Um, come in and uh, come in and listen to the bands. Give some advice on you know if we're coming up for a competition or something like that. So yeah, it's good to. Uh, it's good to have administrators that are advocates of the arts because the arts sure. is always, obviously one of the first things to get um, mixed when we're talking about budgets. I yes. uh, saw so some of that conversation and probably will continue to happen as you know the economy is pretty rough right now with the pandemic and uh, already talking about you know oh maybe yeah. we just don't have music but <laughs> yeah, yeah. it'll uh, that that yeah I'm 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 uh, I'm a big advocate of the arts. It allows kids to to channel a different part of what they do, um, even emotionally, um, right. in, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, so, so, uh, one last teaching question here before we start to wrap this up, sure. what is, what is, what is some advice that you would give a first time educator kind of coming into education here in 2020, obviously we're, we're, we're remote. So that, that, that's an anomaly in some mm -hmm. ways. Um, but, but what, it, what is some advice you would give an educator? The big, the biggest piece of advice I always give is to get to know your students, develop um, relationships with them, which sounds kind of vague in general, but the thing that new teachers seem to have the most difficulty with is um, what they'll call behavior management or classroom management. And I firmly believe that the only way to, to um, tackle that classroom or behavior management goal is to know your kids and have relationships with them um, that are positive and they know that you care because if they don't think you care, then they have no reason not to misbehave. Yeah. Why not? I get attention, whether it's positive or negative, I'm going to, I want attention from you. And if it's only going to be negative, fine, that's, I'll do the, what I need to do to get the negative attention from you. So, um, but in order to develop those relationships, that's easier said than done. Right. So especially virtually the teachers really need to um, find creative and innovative ways to, to get to know the students and their families. And students are going through more than we did when we were kids. It sure seems sure. like it anyway. And so that is makes, you know, an additional hurdle perhaps um, 
to get to know your, your kids well. But it's amazing to see the difference sometimes between uh, a teacher that has a good relationship with a kid and how that student will act in that class compared to the same student five minutes later in another class who doesn't have a good relationship with that teacher and how that student will. And I get to, as a principal, see that from time to time. Yeah. Um, and it, that's, so that would be my, my, my main uh, suggestion. I don't think that my daughter is going to be a teacher, but she's actually in the teaching magnet at our high school. Okay. And so we'll talk a lot about education because of the classes that she has to take. And that's one thing I reiterate to her often is that um, the successful teachers in almost every single case are the ones who have strong relationships with their kids, especially in elementary and middle school. Yeah. Yeah. And I can imagine sometimes you'll have a teacher come to you and tell you about a kid and it's like, hey, this kid's driving me crazy. He won't listen. He's doing this. And then you're thinking, well, I just talked to his other teacher and she's telling me how much he's excelling. And it's like, wait a second, we got to figure out where we're where we're where we're missing things here. So. Uh, okay, so we'll wrap this up. Um, what we'll do typically how we wrap it up is I ask you two um more personal questions or questions maybe kind of designed to more towards you okay. and then and then something kind of new we've added so um i've been on your side of the interview um a lot and i've always sitting there and i'm thinking man i'd really like to ask this person interviewing me a question so at mm -hmm. the end i'm actually going to turn it over to you and allow you to ask me a question um at the end so uh my first question to you is um what is one book that you would recommend to all educators in our current time? Uh, that's a good question. Um, a book that I, I guess I'll recommend a book that I constantly go back to. Um, I see it as valuable uh, for my own journey and I've read it a couple times and that is Good to Great, Jim Collins. Yep. And I know it's a popular book and a lot of people will say it's a, uh, a book that they like. But it's, I specifically like it because of the idea of um, not settling for mediocrity, whether it be mediocrity with relationships with kids or mediocrity with, hey, you know, our test scores are pretty good or whatever mediocre thing you can think of of the day. Um, we can't rest on that because if 70 percent of our students are proficient in reading, that means 30 percent of them aren't. And so, yep. and then that's not okay. And so in order to get from good, which is 70% to great, which is a hundred percent, we need to figure out a path to get there. And so, I, I, and I, I do like books too, that don't necessarily talk about education because I have to read so much about education. It's kind of nice to read it like a business oriented book and try to apply that to what I'm doing. So that's a, uh, a book I think would be good for anybody at any level, even a new teacher. Um, you were good as an intern. How are you going to be a great teacher? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a good book. I have, I have read it myself. It's a great book. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so a common question that I ask, because mm -hmm. I do find this fascinating. Um, so, and I know how important this is. So I do all the cooking in my house. Um, mm -hmm. my wife, she can't, she can't boil water. Um, mm -hmm. and she, and she will tell you that like she, we, we have an agreement that I, I do all the cooking and she, uh, she, she cleans up the mess and picks up. So, um, I know this because I also do all the grocery shopping. Mm -hmm. So I know as educators, you have to miss your planning period. You have to fill in for another teacher. You miss your lunch, you know, these different things. What is your go-to snack that you keep in the office? Go-to snack. I, um, I've been trying not to, uh, <laughs> yeah, here, I'm going to give you an answer that you haven't had yet. You ready? Okay. All right. I have actually been interested, uh, lately in this idea of fasting and how okay. healthy it can be for you. Yep. And it has, has actually helped me to focus when I'm fasting. So it's the opposite of getting a snack, obviously, but, yep. Yep. um, just the health benefits that I've been reading, uh, about that, um, that you can gain from fasting. Um, intermittent and I felt it. I'm yeah. Familiar. Intermittent fasting. Yeah. I so, yeah. Um, and I'm not necessarily trying to lose weight, but just the mental clarity and focus that I can get um, during that has been surprising because I thought I would just be hungry and miserable or hangry, yes. as they say. Yes. Um, and I was from time to time. But now that I've gotten used to a flow with it and um, doing it the right way, drinking a lot of water, tea, coffee, whatever the case might be, um, that that's kind of my go to when I'm stressed out. I think about how I can can maybe find some time to fast. I, uh, I, I have done a, a fair amount of research on it and, and I do it from time to time as well. I will give you a tip and this sounds counterproductive in different ways, but the water that you drink, if you will add a couple shakes of salt 
to a big glass of water. I think I when have you're that. Mm -hmm. Yes. When you're doing it, it'll actually cut down on some of the like the headache when you first start to do it and some yeah. different things. So it'll right. actually um, the brain fog will kind of will kind of subside a little bit faster. So um, and and it, having, and it, said that, having said that, though, I got to tell you, you know, if it's it's been a long day, you know, PTSA meeting late at night or, or back to school night or something on the way home, I'm looking for a cheesesteak. <laughs> my silly roots <laughs> uh, gee, man i tell you what yeah we don't um actually no i take that back we actually have a philly uh like a it's like a um it's it's a it's a mom and pop and i don't think it's open yet um because of everything going on but we actually have a, a philly cheesesteak restaurant coming in here to where i am i think we have fort knox nearby yeah. so there's a lot of there's a um uh, kind of a, a melting pot of people from all different parts of the world and some, and they end up staying here and, and, and staying in the community. And I think someone from Philly is doing that. So I'm, I'm pretty, uh, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, uh, I'm pretty, I'm pretty pumped Definitely uh, gotta check it out. about, about that coming yeah. in. So, so, so now I'm going to turn the platform over to you and allow you to ask a question uh, with me. All right. Well, you said you're not an educator necessarily, although you obviously know a lot about education. What would you like to see the role of technology, specifically distance learning, be post-pandemic? So it's it's interesting that you asked um, because I've I've looked into this and I've talked to a lot of different people um, in Silicon Valley and some different things of having some conversations. I believe that education has always been um, ripe for disruption, right? Um, and I think what the pandemic has done has accelerated that in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, and and, I, and, I, and there's a two part answer I'm going to give. One, yes, there are definitely some negatives at, like anything, right? Like me driving a car, there's a negative. Someone may get hurt. I may run, you know, what, whatever. Right. So with technology and those different things, there are. I have always struggled with as a parent saying, I, I want my kids to be able to navigate life like I I navigate life and, and to have the self-awareness and understanding, but I don't want them to go through what I went through as a child. And this has created, I believe, that studies will come out of this 10, 15, 20 years from now, and we're going to see a much more resilient group of young people becoming mm -hmm. adults a much more adaptive. Um, they're going to be maybe able to navigate change from a, from a technology standpoint better from a tr in a quicker transition mm -hmm. uh, because they're doing it. And let's be honest. I mean, these kids, I, I, I've, I've heard stories. A lot of these, some of these students are even telling the teacher, Hey, your screen's not on. You need to go do this, this, and this. And, you know, they're going That's there. True. And so, I, so what I think is going to happen is we're going to see, it's, it's kind of like anything else, right? The, when something happens, an extreme happens. So, so, so all of a sudden everybody's at home. Well, now it's going to kind of go back right. to a little bit of a new middle. And I think we're going to have, we're going to have some school districts that are going to go three days a week and one or two days a week. That's just is how it's going to be. And you're going to check in and um, high school kids. Do I need you in the classroom five days a week? And could you be doing three days a week and then also doing some real world, um, you know, interning and some different things during the day instead of just one period a day, you know, as a senior, you know, so, so it's these different things that we could be doing that, it's just implementing technology and, and equipping our children. I went to um, on my first trip, and, and, and this is why I think of this. I, I went to um, I went to Shanghai on my first trip, and I walked into an elementary school, and uh, they were teaching robotics, and hmm. then they had a culinary class in elementary school. Now, I've told that to other elementary teachers, and they're you know, they, the, the, their face looks like what, <laughs> like they would do what, but what they were teaching them was how to prepare a meal for, to take to school. So how to make a sandwich, oh, how to, you know, do some, what would happen is these kids, they sat at this table where there was four spaces and this panel would come up out of the, out of the table and it had a camera 
that looked down onto the table. So the teacher sat at the front of the room okay, and would teach. So it had a TV. So she was teaching, but she hmm. could also see what the kids were right. doing without having to walk. It, it was, and, and I'm thinking, why is this not in America? Yeah. Like this is, yeah. this is, I learned to cook because of no one was home and my parents, you know, worked and then also went back to school when I was young. So if you were hungry and didn't want to eat at eight o'clock at night, you figured out how to boil something or cook something and those kind of things. So in that, that that's what you did. So I think we're going to see um, an influx in technology. It will take not to get political and that's not where I'm going with it. But I believe right now that either one of our presidential candidates, if the world, if our safety depended on them setting up their own email address, I think we, I think we would be in trouble. Um, so, so I think we have to have younger candidates in different offices and more technologically uh, astute people who understand, right. You know, when we're, when we're talking about how to, you know, technology and iPhone and, you know, these different things of, of how to do that. So I think, I think that's accelerated that a little bit. And I think we're going to have a more hybrid because you still want to get that in-person model, right? You, you, right. You, you still want to do that, but it, it, it's kind of like the NFL, right? The NFL used to have preseason games. They used to have all this stuff before the season and they're seeing, wait a second, why why were we doing all of that why were we yeah. you know putting these guys in because guys were getting injured during those times why would we do and and it's just an evolution of everything evolves everything changes everything grows and and i think technology is just going to give us something um i don't know how you may agree or disagree with that i agree with a lot of it i, I just wonder how much people are going to start to realize that this whole idea of going to school from eight to three, 10 months of the year is not based on anything that exists in the world today. If it's based on, you know, an agrarian society, obviously that was a long time ago. Yes. Uh, and some yes. districts have seen that obviously, especially ones further South where they have some AC in their buildings and they can go year round. But um, yeah, why not, why not be home if you're in 11th grade? Why can't you be home two of the days of the week? And because you can do work at 10 o'clock at night because that works better for you. It doesn't work for you to do it at 730 in the morning in a different building necessarily. So yeah, it'll so, be interesting to see what we do with all that. So, so I want to ask one last question that you brought that up. Are you familiar much with the education system in Australia? No, I'm not. I'm going to, I'm going to connect you with a really good friend of mine off air just because networks are always good to have. Um, he, he, he's, he's been a headmaster over there and, uh, he's cool. a principal at a, um, uh, at an indigenous school over there now. Okay. Um, uh, but their approach to education is I, I am envious of it. It, it, yeah. it, it would, and I've got a couple of educators that we've interviewed now that'll, that'll end up being on, uh, on here. So, so you'll get to see some of those conversations. Um, cool. uh, but, but it is, they are very much about the holistic approach to each student and each student learns. Um, uh, Peter, Peter Foster is, is who is, is one of the guys I'm speaking of. He, he's like a brother to me. Um, so he was at a, a private school, $26 million a year, hmm. private school had a, you pull into security and, to go through and you would walk into the, you would walk into the, into the, into the library. And as you walk down the aisle, it's like being at the grocery store, the lights would come on. And then when you leave the aisle, the lights would go off. They collected all the rainwater on campus. They, when they built the buildings, they built all the walls, the interior walls removable. So you could wow. slide and move them around so we could yeah. adjust. And, you know, it, it's, it's just, it, it's, it's really, really fascinating. And if you ever get a chance to take a vacation, and to go, I'd be more than happy to connect with with some people over there because just seeing how they do things, just from a way, um, not necessarily that it's better than what we do. It's just a different, open mind. I think they are he ahead of, um, of where we are in how they approach. It's not just here's this educational box. Right. You have to learn this so you can pass this test, and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think some people like me get left out in the cold and, sure. um, you know, those kind of things. But, uh, Dr. Elmendorf, uh, it has been a pleasure to have Likewise. you on here. It, yeah. it, 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 this was awesome to, um, 
to really hear because like I said, I never know what um you know what I'm getting into or who I'm gonna be talking to. Uh, and I've had some interesting conversations. Uh -huh. Um, some that have only lasted 10, 15 minutes. Uh and uh yeah, it's it's it it, it, it truly is um having someone who is like you who has that approach and I don't know you outside of this, um, but, but has the approach that you do not only just with your students, but also with your staff and kind of how you, how you have that empathy and understanding of them and, and what you expect of them and, and, and what you look for in them to, to create that, um, that, that important prestigious level of education that, that you have control over that you can help bring those quality people in. So, it sounds like you definitely, you, you know, you definitely embody accepting those challenges and doing that. And, uh, um, man, I'd love to have you back on sometime yeah. where I'm, I'm actually looking to have a couple different, um, principles from maybe different parts of the world all in one conversation and just kind of sharing different ideas and dialogue and communication yeah, awesome. because yeah. get, I think get that, that guy from Australia, that, I want to talk to him. That sounds Oh, awesome. absolutely. He, he would, he innovative. would. Yeah. He, 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 he would, he would love to, he, he would love to do that. He, he would love awesome. to do that. So, Great. Uh, Thanks. yeah, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on and, and sharing your time and, uh, um, coming in and, and, and again, sharing, sharing some insight because I, I have no doubt that, that we've had some value that have been given to some different educators out there. So, so I appreciate you coming on. Thanks for having me. Appreciate thank it. Thank you, sir. All right. Cheers.